Kia ora team, my name is Ben and today we're going to talk shock. So, in the medical world, shock doesn't mean rah, I'm scared or surprised, or shock isn't the fact that you can see my forehead finishes at the back of my head instead of the front. Shock is an adequate oxygen delivery and consumption at a cellular level. So this is important because oxygen is what we use to make ATP or energy. So we need to get it from in the world to our cells so we can be healthy and alive. So we need three things to avoid shock. We need adequate ventilation. So ventilation is the movement of air in and out of our lungs, just like you ventilate a house by opening a door or a window. We also need oxygenation. So this is where our oxygen moves out of our alveoli and into our bloodstream. And then finally, we need perfusion or blood flow. So we need adequate circulating blood to circulate the oxygen around our body. Now let's look at the main categories. So here we have it. We've got distributive and circulatory. So these are our broad categories. So think circulatory being like at a petrol station and you've got a pump, you've got pipes, and you've got your fuel, cardiogenic, problem with the pump, hypovolemic, not enough fuel and obstruction, uh, blockage in the pipes. And then we've got distributive, which is where those things are fine, but for some reason, we've got massive amount of vasodilation. Our blood vessels are way too big for the amount of blood volume we have, and therefore we can't adequately circulate that blood. All right, let's have a look at them one by one. So neurogenic, we have increased stimulation of our parasympathetic nervous system and decreased stimulation of our sympathetic nervous system by some central nervous system pathology or injury. So our parasympathetic nervous system, that's our rest and digest. So this causes vasodilation, whereas our sympathetic nervous system is fight, flight, fright and vasoconstriction of our peripheries. If we've got too much vasodilation because our parasympathetic nervous system is kicked on too much, then we're going to have all our blood sitting on our periphery and not being able to circulate as much. Then septic shock, this is where we get a systemic infection. Our body's response to an infection goes systemic, whole system wide, and we get massive vasodilation. And then lastly, anaphylactic shock. This is a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. So the person has a hypersensitivity reaction to peanuts or a bee sting, and we get massive amount of vasodilation. Same problem. Okay, distributive. And then back to our circulatory. So our first one, hypovolemic. Hypo, low. Vol, volume emic of the blood. So that makes sense. So it's easy to think, oh, okay, this person is just bleeding out, but there's more things that can cause it than just bleeding out. So yes, we can bleed externally and have a, a nasty cut and lose blood volume, but we can also bleed internally. So remember, a lot of fractures or organs, they can cause massive amounts of blood loss that just build up inside a cavity of our body. And if that blood's not in a circulation, it's going to cause hypovolemic shock. Other things, so dehydration. If we have chronic vomiting or diarrhea, we're going to get dehydrated and therefore we're going to lose blood volume. And we can also have third space losses. So third space is not in our cells, not in our blood. So fluid that's leaked out into the third space. So an infection, massive amount of inflammation or burns can all cause this, the swelling to leave circulation, leave the cells and cause hypovolemic shock. So the fuel, next the pump. So cardiogenic, cardio heart, genic creation. So cardiogenic shock is shock that's created because of a problem with our heart, our pump. So this is where we have decreased cardiac output despite an adequate blood volume. 
So our pump is the problem. Uh, it could be intrinsic to the heart itself. So we've got a myocardial infarction. So this is when part of the heart is infarcting or dying. And if the heart dies, then it can't beat. So dead meat don't beat. So this could lead to cardiogenic shock. An arrhythmia, the heart isn't beating correctly, and therefore we're not circulating enough cardiac output. We can have valve problems. So remember we've got those four valves in the heart that go between the atrium and the ventricle on either side, and then leaving the right ventricle, the pulmonary valve, going to the lungs, and leaving the left ventricle, the aortic valve, going to the aorta around the body. So either they can have stenosis, where they're not opening up enough, so that's going to decrease the cardiac output, or we can have regurgitation, where they're backflowing. The valve, instead of slamming shut and stopping backflow, will then buckle and let blood go back in the wrong direction. So either way is bad. We can also have extrinsic factors that stop the heart from pumping properly. So if we think of a tension pneumothorax, this is if we get a wound and it punctures our pleural cavity, then it creates a little trap door. So as we breathe in, it sucks air into the pleural space. And as we breathe out, that trap door shuts and the air gets stuck. So each breath in, we get a bigger and bigger amount of air coming to that pleural space. And as we breathe out, the trap door shuts and it can't escape. So more and more air collapsing the lung is going to start pushing on the heart and if it builds up too much it's going to squash the heart and prevent preload, prevent filling of the ventricle. That could definitely cause it. Then we also have cardiac tamponade. Uh, the heart is surrounded by like two layers of glad wrap called the pericardium. So peri means around, cardium heart. And if we have some trauma or an infection, and in between those two layers of pericardium, we've got a little amount of fluid. If we get a lot of fluid in between there, and the pericardium can't stretch, then it's going to push in and squash the heart, leading to cardiogenic shock. So that would be an extrinsic factor. And then finally, we've got obstructive shock. So we had the pump, the fuel, and now the pipes. So an obstructive shock is literally a mechanical obstruction to blood flow. So what type of things can obstruct the blood flow? Uh, a pulmonary embolism, an embolism, a clot or a fat tumor that's floated and got stuck into the pulmonary circulation. So now the blood can't circulate past it. A dissecting aortic aneurysm, so that's where we get an aneurysm in our aorta. So the aorta bulges out and then the inner surface tears and then blood starts dissecting, going in between the two layers and bulging outwards. So the blood's no longer in circulation. So that can cause an obstructive shock. Then we've got our pneumothorax, like we talked about before, as the Pleural space fills with air, squashes the lung, which then pushes over and starts to squash our vena cava, our big blood vessels that are going to enter the heart. And then a hemothorax, same thing, except now it's blood in the pleural space, fills up the pleural space, squashes the heart, and then starts to squash the blood vessels before they enter the heart. And also a tumour. So we get a tumour either growing the blood vessel or beside the blood vessel that comes across and squashes it. Obstructive shock. All right, team, there's our categories of shock. So circulatory, a problem with our pump, cardiogenic, problem with the amount of fuel circulating, hypovolemic, and a problem with a blockage in our pipes, obstructive. And then we have the other category of shock with its distributive, where our pipes become way too big and vasodilated and therefore we don't have enough blood volume to fill those pipes and circulate. So we've got septic shock through a systemic infection, we've got neurogenic 
because we have a central nervous system injury and we've got too much stimulation of our parasympathetic nervous system, which vasodilates, and not enough of our sympathetic nervous system, which would vasoconstrict but can't. And then the last, the anaphylactic, which is our type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, where we get massive vasodilation. All right, team, there's shock, done and dusted. All right, team, good work. Your next job is to check out how the body responds to falling blood pressure. So check out this and this. Happy studying, team.